Okay, so we're on lesson five, the life of Jesus in chronological order. And before we begin this lesson, I need to make a correction for one of last week's events. So you might have to make a correction there. And that would be event number 29. Event number 29, and that was John's death. You might just want to make a note on your, you know, on your handout there. What I gave you last week, I don't know how it happened, uh, but uh, the scripture references are incorrect for these. They're not the right scripture. It's the right event, 29, it's in the right order. But I gave you a list of scriptures and none of them are correct. I must have transposed them and as I was copying my notes and, gave the, and I gave them to Celestia. And she, you know. uh, so um, I also want to you know, go on record. I want to thank Carolyn Christensen for pointing this out. She sent me an email and said, hey, I'm looking these things up and they don't match. So that's good. I have a student looking this up for us. A little fact checking. So the correct references for number 29 Event number 29, that'd be lesson number four. Event number 29, the death of John, should be Matthew 14, 1 to 12, Mark 6, 14 to 29, and Luke chapter 9, verses 7 to 9. So the first correction is those are the scriptures that <clears throat> you need to post there. <coughs> Excuse me. And also I mentioned at the time that all four gospel writers mentioned his death. Well, obviously that also is not correct. Only three of the four mentioned his uh, death. Anyways, if you're keeping careful notes and you, you, know, you want to have a, a file where you're keeping all the events of Jesus' life in chronological order along with all the scripture references, uh, you'll need to make that correction in your notes. All right, so we can move on now to our lesson tonight. Remember in the first lesson I gave you the seven periods of Jesus' life. There are a lot of ways to chop it up, but this is one way to do it. This is the main outline that we're following. So far, Jesus has spent most of His time in the northern part of the country with only short periods and short visits to Jerusalem. And after spending the first Passover of his public ministry in Jerusalem, he returns north once again. <coughs> Excuse me. During the year between the second Passover to the third Passover, the Lord will minister exclusively in the area of Galilee, near his original home and the homes of many of his apostles. Doesn't that make sense? You don't see that when you're just reading it. You only see that when you're doing it chronologically. You know, he starts his ministry and he focuses where? Well, where he lives. And he focuses a lot of his ministry where his first disciples and first apostles lived, their families, cultivating those people. And we said in another lesson, you know, he says to one, follow me, and they drop everything and they follow him. And I said to you, it's not like that person never saw him before, never knew him. It didn't work that way. He's been cultivating these people for a time now. So when it comes time to say, OK, you need to get in or get out, we see they're making that final decision to follow him. But he's cultivated these people for a time. So we pick up the story. <clears throat> from the point where he was at Cana in the north, and he now returns to Jerusalem for a brief stay during the second Passover, after which he will then go back to the north. So what we're looking at is the second Passover to the third Passover, the fourth, um, the fourth section here. Now, <clears throat> there are 36 events recorded during this period. And most of them are described by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John only provides the story of the first incident and then he shares a description of the last three. But the bulk of this material are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So event number 33, that's where you'll start your notes tonight. Jesus attends a second Passover that would be in John chapter 5 verses 1 to 47. 
Remember at his first appearance in the temple, Jesus affected the crowds with his zeal. What did he do? Cleansed the temple, right? He cleansed the temple. People were saying, wow, this guy's on fire. And he also did signs and he, his teaching. And so the priests at the beginning saw him as a nuisance. And they tried to just get rid of him by confronting him. How dare you? Who gives you the right to do that? Who are you? You're, you're nobody. You know? you're, you're, you're a troublemaker. But the second Passover appearance really will infuriate the Jews because he does two things that, that for them is over the, it's one thing to be zealous for the house of the Lord. Everybody, you know, the people can say, well, amen, that, you know, I didn't think that was right that they should be selling animals and so on and so forth within the courtyards. You know. I could see people agreeing with him on that one. But now he does two things that really, really infuriate the Jewish leadership. First of all, he heals a man on the Sabbath and then he orders him to pick up his pallet and go home. And so the leaders accuse him of sinning because he had healed in the temple of all places on a Sabbath. And for them, this was work. I know that in our mindset, we have, a, we have to go a long way to try to figure out how that is work. But for the Pharisees, healing, you, know, you were doing a work. And then, to, to add insult to injury, he gave the man instructions to pick, you know, he says, pick up your pallet and, you know, go your way. Well, even the man picking up his pallet and carrying it, that also was considered working by the Pharisees. So he kind of gets on them you know, in, in two ways. And then the second thing that he does, probably more serious in their eyes, is that in his preaching, he equates himself with God. And so this now is becoming very serious. This was punishable by death if it was untrue. I mean, if it's true, fine, but if it's not true, as far as the Jewish law is concerned, this was punishable by death. So look at his position, how, you know, how he's, you know, the, 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 I'm thinking in French and I don't know why, le chemin, you know. <laughs> look at the way that, you know, that he's come. You know, his position has gone from being a challenger and a nuisance, but now he's become an enemy and a, an actual threat. John says that they begin seeking ways to kill him so that he was now in danger if he stayed in Jerusalem. You know, it's one thing to be a nuisance and to say, look, you can't come in here if you're going to cause trouble. That's one thing. But when the leaders begin plotting your death, now you're in real danger. And so the next event would be the return to Galilee. Luke chapter 14, verses 40, 14 to 30. Now Luke only begins this section with the word and, without connecting it to other events. But the information contained matches other information in Matthew, Mark, Matthew and Mark for this time frame. That's how we hook all this together. So Jesus rejected in Jerusalem, what does He do? Well, He returns to the north once again and goes into His hometown of Nazareth to preach. He's not going to stay in Jerusalem. He's already stirred up trouble there. And of course, He's not there to stir up trouble, obviously, but there's trouble. And when there's trouble, you need to you know, leave, let things cool down a bit. So that's what He does. He leaves. He goes to the north once again. And here also he begins to declare his true identity by telling them that a passage in Isaiah concerning the Messiah referred directly to him personally. Boy, he goes into the synagogue of his hometown and you know, they've heard of him, they've heard of what he's done, they give him the honored position of speaking or commenting after the reading of the scrolls. And what does he do? He says, well, that passage there that in Isaiah referring to the Messiah, that's me. That this has been fulfilled in your day, in your sight. So his people are amazed since how do they see him? Who is he as far as they're concerned? He's the carpenter's son, one of our guys. He's a hometown boy. But when he insists that this is the truth and that if they don't accept it, it will go to the Gentiles. 
In other words, the message will go to the Gentiles. And there's another new development in his preaching. They too become angry and they try to mob him. Notice his preaching, you know. Remember last week I said his preaching, what was he preaching at the beginning? Well, he was preaching the message of John. They were preaching pretty much the same thing. There was a, like an overlap there. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, be baptized. That's what Jesus was preaching. Now he goes to Jerusalem and you know, he, he, he clears the temple and he, he uh, asserts some authority. And he declares that he's the Messiah. And now he goes back home, says the same thing, but he adds another thing, that if they don't accept this, if they don't accept his message, well, he may bring the message to the Gentiles. So you know, today, in today's language, we call it pushing the envelope. He's pushing the envelope. Every time he gets up to speak, there's a little more, more edge to it, pushing, pushing, pushing. And of course, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to push back. And so he escapes their attack, and he, what does he do? He leaves town. <laughs> Lots of leaving town. You know, I'm, I'm comforted by Jesus' moving around a lot, and you know why. <laughs> number 35, event number 35. Jesus settles in Capernaum. Matthew chapter 4, 13 to 17. Mark 1, 21 to 28. And Luke 4, 31 to 37. So after his rejection at Nazareth, he goes to his adult home in Capernaum at the north side of the lake and he settles there. His adult home. You know, I, I sometimes think his adult home. He had a house. He made breakfast. He slept. He bathed. He had a house. He had people over. He had a house. You know, he, didn't, he didn't live like two feet above the ground, you know, um, you know, he didn't do that. He wasn't a beggar, you know, knocking on doors, begging. He, 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 wasn't a, you know, he wasn't one of those. He wasn't like John the Baptist who lived out in the desert. He ate, he drank, he went to weddings, he went to people's houses for dinner, he had people come over to his house for dinner, he had a house. And his house was in Capernaum. So after his rejection as Nazareth, he goes to his adult home in Capernaum. Uh, as I say, the north side of the lake, you know, I, I have to do it backwards. You know. uh, Cana is over here and, and Capernaum's up here and the lake is like this here. I should have had my map out. We'll fix it in post-production. No, we won't, okay. So here in Capernaum, he teaches and performs a miracle. He casts out a demon. But here the people are amazed and they begin spreading the knowledge of him throughout the region, helping the spread of his, of his ministry. Next event, the healing of Simon's, mother, uh, Simon's mother-in-law, Matthew chapter four, uh, Matthew chapter four, I have Matthew chapter eight here, 14 to 17, we'll check that in a minute. Mark one and uh, Luke four, 38 to 41. So we may have a, a difference between these two here. Let me give you the ones that I have in my notes. Again, I may have transposed this incorrectly on my slide. So the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, Matthew eight, 14 to 17, Mark one, 29 to 34 and Luke 4, 38 to 41. We're going too quickly to fact check these as we go. Uh, again, uh, if, if I have a correction, I'll make it next week. All right, so healing of Simon's mother-in-law. Three events come close together and they're hard to put in order since the, uh, the uh, writers tell the story differently from a different perspective. One is the preaching and healing at Capernaum. The second is healing of Peter or Simon's mother-in-law and then there's the call of the uh, apostles. But Mark says that immediately after leaving the synagogue in Capernaum, they went directly to Peter's house and Jesus healed his mother-in-law and many of the sick who sought him out in that place. So this event leads to the next in logical order. And the next major event in logical order is the call of Simon and Andrew James and John. So, oh, I see what's happened here, okay. 
So C37, yeah, there's one that skipped over. So the correct one, Matt, the call of Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Matthew 4, 18 to 22, Mark 1, 16 to 20, and Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. All right, so the call of Simon and Andrew, James, and John. So Mark is out of sync with his account, but his gospel, you have to remember, Mark's gospel is, is like a series of snapshots. You go on a vacation, you snap, you take a picture, you take a picture. That's what Mark's gospel is like. It's like a series of snapshots that are just put together in an album. Luke, on the other hand, is a historian. And Luke is very interested in plotting out everything in, in, in proper order with all the details and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, Mark's gospel is not meant to follow a chronological order like Luke, uh, Luke's gospel. So after the powerful preaching followed by the miracles, uh, even a miracle done for the apostles themselves, you know, Jesus shows them where to find a huge catch of fish. That was just for the apostles. The Lord takes His opportunity to call four men into full-time ministry. Now up until this time, these men have continued their work as fishermen and followed Jesus as disciples, but now Jesus calls on them to leave everything to be with Him full-time. What I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, He's been cultivating these men for quite a while now. They've heard Him teach. They've, they've seen some of the miracles. And now comes the time to make a decision to leave and follow Jesus. And that's the way it works in our lives as well. The Lord calls us little by little. We take a step, we take a bigger step, we take a bigger step. So now their training as apostles will really begin in earnest. Number 38, circuit preaching through Galilee. Uh, and those are the correct uh, passages there. Matthew 4, 23 to 25, Mark 1, 35 to 39, and Luke 4, 42 to 44. So once Jesus has His disciples called, what do they do? Well, they leave on a preaching tour. He's going to train them. He's going to show them what to do. His miracles and teaching, the news of His activity in Jerusalem had caused a great interest in the north, and so Jesus begins the training process of His newly called apostles by taking them along on a preaching tour. I mean, up until this time, Jesus had been doing this by Himself. He's the one that go to, would go into town, or He's the one that would go to the temple, or He's the one that would go to the synagogue, and He would teach, and the disciples, well, they would listen, and they would follow, and they might ask questions, but it was all on Him. But now, He begins to train others. To do, this, to do this work. Jesus heals a leper, Matthew 8, 1 to 4, Mark 1, 40 to 45, and Luke 50, 12 to 16. Notice Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now the Jews believe that when the Messiah came, one of the things that He would be able to do would be to heal lepers, something that hadn't been done before. Now this leper comes to Jesus convinced that Jesus could cure him, and Jesus does. His reason for coming was faith that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus tells him not to tell anybody, to avoid people coming for a cure but not related to faith. I mean, look, they just, they, <laughs> over here on Choctaw Road and 15th, the gas station over there is selling gas five cents a gallon less than the guy across the street and maybe eight cents a gallon less than the people up in Midwest City. And, and I, we were, Lisa and I were driving in this morning to work and before 9 a.m., man, the place was packed. There were cars waiting in line because they're going to save a nickel, excuse me, a nickel a gallon. Could you imagine if there was a miracle happening at the gas station? somebody who had Parkinson's disease, 
and the, and the, and the preacher there put, put his hand on him or just said, just said, be well, and the Parkinson's would leave and that person would be clear-minded and their trembling would stop all of a sudden and their memory restored. Could you imagine the amount of confusion, the amount of people that would be <laughs> at the gas station if, if, we, if we mobbed the place for a nickel off on gas? Could you imagine what we'd do if there was a miracle, a genuine miracle happening? So that's, you know, Jesus says that often to people. You know, don't, don't tell anybody. Because he was af not afraid, but he was concerned that he'd be mobbed. But of course, this man is overjoyed. He cannot contain himself. He tells everybody and this causes the Lord to avoid the cities because of the crowd searching for him and looking for a sign, looking for a miracle. So now that's restricted him further. They go on the uh, preaching tour. He heals a leper. There are crowds. What does he do next? He has a house, remember? <laughs> he goes back to his house. <laughs> he goes back home to Capernaum. Matthew 9, verse 2 to 8. Mark 2, 1 to 12, and Luke 5, 17 to 26. So the leper's unwanted publicity seems to have forced an end to the preaching tour before it was over. And so Jesus returns back to, to Capernaum. And while he's in his home, remember I told you he has, a, he has a house. While he's at his house, the crowds find him. And as I say, these villages, these fishing villages were not very big. You know? he, I'm sure he wasn't very hard to find. But they find him and they come to his house to hear him speak. And it was during this time at his house that several men who couldn't get inside the house through the door, what do they do? Take out, take out his tiles. Remember, it was his house and they were removing tiles from his house to lower somebody down to the floor someone who was paralyzed on a mat through the roof so he could be with the Lord. And what does Jesus do first? He forgives the man for his sins to show his divine authority. And when the scribes sitting there question if he had this type of authority, what does he do? He, he, he proves it. He says, first, your sins are forgiven. And they say, boy, who's this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus knows what they're thinking and He says, well, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sin, what's easier for me to say to this man, stand up and walk or forgive sins? Well, to show you that I have this authority, I will show you I have this authority. Because if I can heal him, then I can forgive his sins as well. Once again, his preaching, the edge that it's taking is he's beginning now to demonstrate not only that he's the Jewish Messiah, but that he's the divine Jewish Messiah, an element that wasn't quite clear. The, Jewish, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah, but they didn't have a clear idea of the exact nature of that Messiah. A savior, yes. Someone that would save them, restore them, yes. Perhaps, in their minds, perhaps a great prophet or a king or, okay, even a miracle worker. But the divine Son of God, they had no idea about that. And so Jesus is teaching this with all of what He's doing. 41, the calling of Matthew. He's already got some apostles. Matthew 9, 9 to 13, Mark 2, 13 to 17, and Luke 5, 27 to 32. After this event, He was by the Sea of Galilee where He found and He called Matthew as His next apostle. So far, most of the apostles are either relatives and fishermen from his own region. Matthew is the first exception. He's not a relative, he's not a fisherman, he's a despised tax collector for the northern region. Now the tax collectors collected Roman tax and then they added a fee on top of the tax for their services. As a tax collector for a foreign government, he was considered a sinner along with gamblers and thieves and herdsmen and customs officials, all these people were considered by the Jews. And as such, they could not act as judges or witnesses against others because of their moral uncertainty. Do you see the irony there? Do you see the irony there? The Jews would not 
except Matthew as a witness in any court proceeding. And Jesus picks him to become one of his witnesses for the resurrection. Jesus nevertheless calls this man to follow and he does immediately. So enthusiastic is he about his call that he invites other Jews to his home for a feast. And of course a lot of his, what kind of friends does he have? Well, they're sinners too. And this causes the Jews to murmur that Jesus is associating with sinners. Of course, Jesus was associating with sinners, but not to share their sins. He was there to call them out of their sins. A Couple of quick things that happen. Uh, questions about fasting in Matthew 9, 14 to 17, Mark 2, 18 to 22, Luke 5, 33 to 39. Again, um, uh, more uh, challenges that are coming on him. Then there are questions on working in Matthew 12, 1 to 8. That would be uh, event 43. I've kind of put these together here. 43 questions on working, Matthew 12, 1 to 8, Mark 2, 23 to 28, Luke 6, 1 to 5, and one more I'll throw into this uh, mix here. So 42, 43, 44, the Pharisees plot his death. This is all the work of the Pharisees. They question him, question him on fasting, they question him on working, and they begin to plot his death, Matthew 12, 9 to 14, Mark 3, 1 to 6, and Luke 6, 6 to 11. So now that he's saturated the north with his healings and miracles, his teaching and witnessing about himself, there begins a concerted effort to discredit him and his teaching. Blowback. There's blowback. At first, it was John's disciples, along with the Pharisees' disciples, who challenged the apostles because they did not fast. <coughs> and then it was the Pharisees who challenged them for eating corn that they picked on the Sabbath. Of course, the answer that Jesus gives to these and all other objections was that Jesus was the Messiah and in His presence no fasting was required and in His service all work was blessed at all times. You can work for the Lord seven days a week if you want to. Of course, the Pharisees rejected the claim of His being the Messiah and when their efforts to discredit Him failed, they began to try to silence him for good, and that's where the plot for his death begins to pick up some steam. 43, 44, 45, Jesus withdraws from the attacks. I mean, you know, he goes to Jerusalem, he stirs things up, he goes back home to the north, calls some apostles, begins to train them, they go on a preaching tour around that area of Galilee, it's cut short because somebody begins to spread too much news, they can't make their way into the cities, he goes back home, you know, and now the Pharisees, the Pharisees were not just in Jerusalem, they were everywhere, the Pharisees, so now the Pharisees, you know, the blowback comes, now the Pharisees are beginning their attack, and so he withdraws from them. The confrontations and plots to take his life uh, force him to withdraw from public places. However, this does not stop the crowds from coming to him all the way from Jerusalem. So Jesus teaches and leads all of those who come to him. So what does he have to do? His, his movement is limited. He can't move as freely as he did at the beginning. So he appoints the twelve. Matthew 10, 1 to 42, Mark 3, 13 to 19, and Luke 6, 12 to 19. His ministry has grown so large that he can't easily move from place to place because of the crowds, because of the threats, but because of the crowds. He cannot venture into the main cities without drawing violence towards himself. So after a long night of prayer, Jesus chooses among his many disciples 12 who will become his apostles. Remember, disciples are those who follow. Apostles are messengers who are sent ahead. So there are many apostles. Barnabas was an apostle. You know, I'm an apostle in that sense. You know, Lisa and I, we went, we went to Guadalupe. You know, we went ahead to Guadalupe to bring the, the message of the gospel and to help that church. And I've, I've traveled to Haiti and I've, you know, I've, we've been in Canada, in Montreal, where the gospel is not being preached. You know, so, so, and, and, and anyone else who, you know, you, but these 12 here will become special apostles. They're the apostles selected by Jesus. 
Okay? So these 12 men who have been disciples from the beginning of his ministry are called to be in exclusive service to him and the gospel as apostles. So he gives them a charge, he gives them instructions about their work, and he empowers them for the task. It's so natural, he can't move. He can't move easily. So he, he gives the charge to 12. And this will change the nature and the growth of his ministry as the apostles will now begin to bring the message ahead of Jesus in preparation for His coming into a place. So the, the strategy changes. Instead of Him just showing up and the crowds coming to Him, the apostles go ahead and they preach and they announce and then He comes in and then they move ahead and then He comes in. So there's a strategy there. Now this section describes a lot of Jesus' work in the north and the growing opposition towards Him but there is one thread that runs through these events and that is the approach of His work and ministry. So just two points here I'll need to make as we close out concerning His ministry. First of all, <clears throat> ministry is in stages. Not only His ministry, but all ministry is in stages. Note God sent Jesus out in stages as a child, as a boy, in a family, in a certain region, the main cities, getting disciples, appointing messengers, everything's in stages. Note also that the disciples grew in their time and commitment. First they were part-time disciples, then they were fully committed as disciples, then they became apostles, and then finally they gave their lives for the cause. In the end, as far as we're concerned, God will want us to be with Him and devoted to Him forever, which would be a joy for us. And so as disciples and ministers we are in this life, we're working our way towards that total devotion. So many people, you know, they're hanging on, they say, I can't wait to go to heaven, but you know, they're hanging on to this life with, with everything they got, you know, with white knuckles. What's the old saying? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but? Nobody, nobody wants to die, but you know what? But nobody, also, nobody wants to give up their life for Jesus. Nobody wants to give up their life for Jesus. We want it all. We want this life, we want the world, we want Jesus and we want heaven. And he says, no, you, you can't do that. It's one or the other. You're going in one direction or you're going in the other. If you don't want total devotion to Him now, what makes us think we're going to have it later? How can we be fully committed to this world now and think that we will be ready to be in the next world later? You know, it's contradictory. Those who love the world, even if they say they're Christians, do so at the expense of devoting themselves to God. You know, we need to check which way we're going, more devoted to God or less devoted to God. And I can tell you one thing. Do not be afraid to devote yourself to God. Amen. Don't be afraid of that. Do not be afraid of that. Do not be afraid if God is calling you to do something great. Do not be afraid if God is asking you to sacrifice something. Do not be afraid if the Lord is calling you into a deeper walk with Him. Don't be afraid of that. Rather, be afraid if the Lord is not speaking to you at all. If He's allowing you to just do your own thing and there's never any challenge in your life and everything is just hunky-dory, if I were you, I'd get on my knees and I'm saying, Lord, you're not paying attention to me. <laughs> and maybe the second thing is ministry is like stone polishing. The example of what Jesus did with the apostles is much like what He does with us in the church. He took 12 very different men a zealot and a tax collector and fishermen and intellectuals and like 12 uncut, unpolished stones, he put them in a bag and he shook them together for three years. And they banged up against each other and they knocked up against each other and you know, three years he shook them up in that bag. Through circumstances and through work and through challenges and through failure. And after three years, he opened that bag and 11 of them came out smooth and polished like jewels and one of them was crushed to dust. 
Well, believe it or not, it's the same method today in the church. Different people, different backgrounds, different things. And what does Jesus do? He puts us in this bag called the church and He shakes us around year after year after year after year with challenges and disappointments and success and work and service and ministry and, and all that and worship. And hopefully at the end, He'll pull out all these smooth and beautifully polished jewels that will go into His crown. So I hope we can remember those ideas as we pursue our ministry in the kingdom. The bell has rung. We're out of material and time. Thank you for your attention.